Have you ever had a friend that you've known for a very long time in many situations, maybe at school and in university and then a few times afterwards, and then you see them again, maybe online or in person, and think, what on earth? They've changed uh, lifestyle, they've changed their look, whatever it happens to be. And you ask yourselves, yourself, do I actually know this person? You know, if somebody has a sudden change in character, especially someone who you thought you knew, um, then you're guaranteed to ask yourself, well, do I really know this person after all? And uh, this passage is a little bit like that. Genesis 38. What do we have in the second chapter? The third chapter, fourth chapter? Uh, well, within the first few chapters, we have God with his own hands, as it were, killing someone. Next, we have an issue of, uh, let's just say, bodily fluids, male bodily fluids. Uh, then God kills another person. And then you, you, you go th through the chapter and what do you find? You find someone dressing up as a prostitute to seduce her former father-in-law so that uh, she can have a child with him. It gets very, very weird. And you should be asking yourself, do I, do I really know uh, the God who, who wrote this? You know, Do I really know what's going on? What, what is going on here? That's a good question to ask because that's how you get to know um, God more by, by, by admitting, well, okay, well, maybe I don't know so much after all. And that's the exercise that I want to, to go through. And, you know, you can't really overhype this passage in terms of uh, the weird things that are going on. You, you really can't. And, but you need to know more about God's character and what he values and doesn't value in order for this to make sense at all. It's easier to skip over it, or if you do tackle it, it's very easy to say, oh, well, God was different back then, which is, of course, heresy. It's awful. It's to apply change to God. It's to un-God God. Or you could say, well, he was a naughty boy, and she was a naughty boy, and those two boys were naughty boys, and, and just say, we're much better now. <laughs> oh, really, we are? Uh -huh. mm. Well, uh, let's turn to this passage. If you really want to um, learn something, let's, let's, let's get to the meat of this. So we're going to go through verse by verse and see what comes up. Chapter 38 of Genesis. After all, it's 150th of the most important foundational book in the Bible. Why should God put it there? And why should God put it in the middle of the Joseph passage, the Joseph story? Why? Well, there is a very good reason. There are many very good reasons. Okay. So, and it came to pass that uh, at that time, Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. Okay. What do we have here? We have a parallel to the Joseph account. Ah, that's why it's here. It's to offer us a parallel. Uh, one brother, another brother. Judah was the best of the brothers so far in many ways in that he didn't want to kill his brother. That makes him a real upstanding fellow. He just wanted to sell him into slavery. That seems reasonable. But yeah, he was he was a better one. And he was better as well because he was disgusted by the activity of his, of his brothers and said, I'm getting out of here. I don't want anything to do with those boys. And he does so. And again, he, he does so because he has the ability to do so. So he's a man of means, like all of his brothers, but a man of initiative. He, he's, he's showing forth his character here. And um, you might remember in another story with a descendant of, of uh, Judah, uh, the cave of Adullam. So this land that's being talked about, his, um, his uh, ancestors will inherit, he will inherit uh, through the tribe of Judah. By the way, there's a lot of talk about the Jews at the moment. And uh, the Jews derive their name from this man, which should also inform us as to how important this is. This is the most extensive uh, passage devoted to, to Judah, who uh, gives his name to the Jews. Okay. All right. So he goes down. He, he is unforced, as it were, whereas, um, uh, uh, whereas uh, Joseph, his brother, was, um, was not, uh, was forced, obviously into slavery. 
okay, he went down from his brothers. Who else went down? Looking for parallels so far. Uh, yeah, Lot went down away to um, a bad place, Sodom and Gomorrah, for opportunities there. And there's nothing wrong with seeking opportunities, but uh, not with bad people. Not when you're surrounded with bad people, eh? normally speaking. So, um, and we know what happened to Lot. So what's going to happen to Judah? All right. He's already making alliances or making uh, find, uh, making some sort of a deal with uh, this guy, Adolamite Hira. That's the first thing he does is make good friends, confidential chums. Uh, and what happens next? Verse 2, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. Now that does not mean uh, fornication, that means uh, marriage. So he married her. Is that a problem? Yes, it's a huge problem. Why? Because the Canaanites uh, didn't belong, uh, they didn't own the land, they were to be disinherited, and his family were to inherit it. So there's something wrong here. And we can get that confirmed by the fact that um, uh, Ishmael, the ungodly son, he married a Canaanite wo woman, and uh, Isaac and Abraham went to great lengths to ensure that their sons did not marry, uh, their faithful sons did not marry a Canaanite. He knows all this. He's been taught all this, but it doesn't matter to him. He has a certain need. And yeah, so this tells us about Judah. Not only has he sold his brother into slavery, but he's really not that interested in uh, pleasing his parents and heeding the advice of history, uh, the advice of God's law as it's revealed to him. All right, what happens? He conceived, bear a son, called its name Er, E-R, Er, meaning strength. Wow, strong guy. What's he strong at? We'll see in a minute. And she conceived again and bear a son. No, oh no, Er. No, Er means God, God watches, I believe, sorry. Onan means strength. And she conceived again and bear a son. And she called his name, his name Onan. No, no, no. Okay. She, yeah, yet again, she conceived and bear a son. And uh, she called his name Sheila. Oh dear. Sheila means um, droop, I believe. Uh, he was at Chesib. When she bare him, again, this would be Judah's country. And Judah took a wife for, okay, so three sons via someone who, sh who should never have married. He has all the example in the world from Noah's uh, son Ham, whose son Canaan did something despicable. We don't know what. Uh, that was sort of sexual in nature. So you don't come out on the ski. It was a constant uh, annoyance and tribulation to uh, the godly, uh, the godly, these Canaanites. They were just bad news. We got a special look at uh, the low character of the best man of Shechem. And he just saw a woman and went and said, oh, well, I'm going to take her. Very low character. We've also seen Solomon Gomorrah, incredibly low character. Not the person that you're going to want to mar uh, marry at all if you're at all interested in the covenant. But it appears he wasn't very much. And uh, again, this is setting the character for the, the Jews and their constant rebellion and ignoring of God's law. The Bible doesn't gloss out anything over. over. There's no PR in, in the Bible, as it were. There's no flattery in the Bible that gives us what we need and that gives us the truth. Okay. And uh, there are warnings for us here galore. And Judah took da, 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 and our Judah's first. Oh, and Judah took a wife for er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Interesting, interesting in that Tamar is a name that occurs again in Scripture. It's an unfortunate story, but what's significant is that David, who was a descendant of Judah, and uh, of course David was a uh, for uh, father of Jesus Christ after after the flesh. He chose to name one of his daughters, Tamar, knowing all this. And Tamar's name occurs again in the book of uh, Ruth, where a blessing was given to Ruth uh, that involves the name of Tamar. So this is a significant character here, one who is celebrated in a certain way. Okay, why would you want to celebrate it if you know what's going, on, going to happen? Why would that be? Uh, right, so er. Uh, God sees, uh, and our Judas firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Do I know God? 
is this the God? Is this? I thought God was love. I thought, you know, God is love, yes. And uh, God is consuming fire. We can't leave anything out. We can't look at anything in the Bible which talks about God and his character and his law and say, oh, well, I choose to lay, lay, lay that uh, to one side. Uh, uh, you know, God has moved on from that. We just can't do that. We have to include all of this. All of this is part of God. He's a complex character and everything he does is perfect. So that was totally just. We don't know what he did, but God saw it, as his name says, and he slew him. Now, we might want to compare this character Ur er, with um, all the other people who God slew, Nadab and Abihu, who were slain for reasons of um, uh, um, cultic reasons, and uh, Dathan and Abiram, and these rebellions against authority. Okay, very significant. A God by his own hands. Sometimes he chose to use a nation to uh, execute his will in taking people out. Sometimes he gives that to the civil government. He does give that to the civil government in capital crimes. So life is only to be taken on God's terms and God reserves the right to take uh, take life um, on, 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 of course, on his terms justly. So, but we might then ask why why so strict with Ur when Canaan got off the hook for such a long time? It's only after uh, many centuries that um, God's people are given that task, having been made a nation by God, having been taken out of Egypt. Why so strict with some and some lenient to others? And you might say, well, it's just God. He does what he likes. And that's true. But he also works according to his character. He's consistent with his character. What is what is the thing we need to highlight here? Well, it's the fact that Tamar and uh, Ur were covenant. Uh, Ur, who was killed, was a covenant member. He was he had the mark of circumcision. He had entered the covenant, um, and God judges. And this is an important thing to realize for today. God would never judge the church. God would never um, chastise the church. Or well. This is entirely wrong because we see here that uh, to whom much is given, much is demanded. All right. And we see in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28 that God can even take the light, not if we are continually faithful, faithless in um, persecuting as he, as he would in blessing. So we got to get to know who God is. Read it, Deuteronomy 28, the chapter of curses and blessings. Our sins... In Northern Ireland, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, our sins as Christians and as Christianized peoples, baptized peoples, whether we go to still go to church or not, it doesn't matter if, if we are in uh, of the covenant outwardly, we will be judged more, not less, severely. All right. Um, wicked in the sight of the Lord, Lord, slew him. Now, I've neglected to mention about Tamar. Tamar. There's no indication that she was a Canaanite. It, 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 it leaves out what was uh, a Shua, uh, what described Shua. Shua was, was a Canaanite. Tamar, well, if, if she was a Canaanite, she's not singled out as being a Canaanite. And her character later on, uh, there's a lot to commend it. So I'm going to say that Tamar, maybe she was uh, Canaanite in... Um, by birth, but she wasn't Canaanite in their character altogether. I would say that she wouldn't wasn't a Canaanite, and this is entirely possible because we find pockets of believers in, for example, the king of Salem, Melchizedek, and in those two characters with whom Abraham had an alliance, and even at one stage Abimelech was of the covenant. How do we know that? Because both um, Abraham and after him, Isaac, made a covenant with him, which was not possible unless they too were covenant members. All right. So it's entirely possible, and I think likely, that Tamar was not a Canaanite. She knew the true religion. Okay. Now, um, verse 8, we might say, ooh, I, that's horrible. And Judah said unto Onan, go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. 
That's disgusting. I would never do that. That's horrible. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do we know God? Do we want to know this about God? Think of the book of Ruth. What's going on there? The same principle is at work. Judah, he's a little bit lukewarm to say the least. Is he interested in the, in the, being a righteous man in terms of his marriage? No, but he's certainly interested in, in uh, having his sons live by that standard. She picks, he picks out a good one. And when there's a death in the family, what is he enforcing? He's enforcing the law of uh, the leverets, which is written down later on, but it's certainly evidence that it's, uh, that it's in operation here. What is the law of the leveret? That if a son dies, uh, if a, some, uh, someone dies without an heir, his brother, who is of age, of course, raises up a seed. So what would happen then is that the uh, the son born of that union would take on the name, or in this case, and would take on the inheritance. All right, what would that mean for Onan if he did so, if he was faithful? Uh, well, his own inheritance, which would have been very considerable, considering how wealthy Judah would have been as uh, the... Um, perhaps the best son or the finest son of the patriarch who may have uh, had a good chance of inheriting, but his inheritance would have been cut by a third. And if he was a faithful son, even more because uh, he would have had the responsibility of the uh, chosen son. He would get an extra allowance and also the care of... Um, that he would have the responsibility and the blessings of the firstborn. He didn't want to do that. It wasn't purely a, a sexual thing. It wasn't just like, like, that he didn't uh, like children. Uh, he was thinking of himself. He was manifesting his Canaanite blood, even though he was outwardly of the covenant. So if we don't like this arrangement, say, oh, wow, it's terrible, it's awful. We are doing something, which I would never do that. Well, Onan was killed by the hand of the Lord for not doing what he should have done according to the word of God. And this is the core principle of the book of Ruth too, which everybody coos over. Oh, that's a lovely story. That's beautiful. Oh, the love there. There's no discrepancy between the law of God and love. Love is the fulfilling of the law, the putting into force of the law, as our Lord tells us. So let's check ourselves. Do we know God? This is God says this is good. Onan said, I don't like it. And what happens? He, uh, oh well. <clears throat> and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. Uh -huh. As I said, it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife and he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. He did the deed and spilled the seed. The Bible is a very plain book. And if we're squeamish about this, well, we should be to a certain extent. But if we can't talk about it, then that's a problem. The problem's with us. The problem's not with uh, the text of Scripture. It gives us what we need. We need to hear this stuff. All right. And the thing that which uh, thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew, the, slew him also. All right. It, this was something so wicked that God, by his own hand, just slew him. Do we have priorities right? At the moment, there's a... Um, is there, there, do people even know the Ten Commandments? Do Christians even know the Ten Commandments? I really doubt that um, 5 and 10 or well, the 8 and 10, uh, what, uh, that, uh, that 1 and 10 perhaps could recite the Ten Commandments who are under 40, under 30. So how can we have the same moral framework as God? And remember, he hasn't changed. All right. Um, right, here's the crux of the problem that uh, develops. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house, till Sheila, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her, in her father's house. There's a lot in this rather unsuspecting uh, verse. A lot there. First of all, we know about the law of the leveret. You have to raise up the seed. But what about the seed, the seed that was to come? 
there was an imperative not just according to the dominion mandate to go uh, go forth and multiply but there was more specifically the uh, need to raise up a seed as in this seed that is christ the the messiah the one who would come the one who would be the, the sacrifice to atone for sins that was the hope of the believer in the old testament and in the new testament otherwise they were unbelievers whether they had the circumcision mark or not but there's there's so he had that um imperative he was one of the chosen line and it could have been him it could well have been him it was him in fact and humanly speaking if he failed to carry out uh, his duty then um well humanly speaking the christ wouldn't come all hope would be lost and he seems is, is he really interested in it what happens well less per, per, per adventure he die also he he knows his his third son his third son is like weak that's what his name means or drooping hmm yeah and he knows that he'll likely be killed by god because he's an evil character he's seen the pattern he knows his son and he puts the brake on now in that he's just like isaac in his later years isaac favored he would rather uh just like isaac he would rather have um the uh f favor hit the ungodly son over over the over the potential godly one there was no son born yet but uh, to uh, uh judah uh, to this union of um his sons with tamar but isaac chose um esau over jacob because he liked esau's stew and humanly speaking his action of wanting to give the blessing and going ahead and and desiring to give the blessing to Esau would, humanly speaking, have scuppered the chance of Messiah coming, humanly speaking, because and what happens when you give the blessing to the ungodly? Well, the world is turned upside down. It shouldn't be. That's humanly speaking. So what he's doing as the most impressive son, as the son who would, uh, through whom the, the Messiah would come, it, it, there's more at stake here than just um than than, than just uh, you know a small family matter in addition if we consider the book of ruth which is uh, an extended um essay as it were on the tells us a lot about the nature of how the um law of the leveret was worked out number one it wasn't just the brother it was whatever wider family that had the responsibility because in the book of Ruth, he goes to one character. He says no. He is offered the opportunity to say no. He says, well, I don't want to um, raise up this seed. I don't want to split my inheritance. All right. And it passed then to someone else. Did Judah give this opportunity to his son? No. He was Judah. He was the one who held the scepter. He was the boss. In addition, um, we have Ruth and we have Orpah. Is Orpah forced to come with who is divorced from her husband by death, so to speak? Is she forced to come to the promised land? No. Said, do you want to do this? Well, I love you, but no. Ruth said, I love you. I love the covenant. I, love, I know the Lord. Yeah, I absolutely want to. Yeah, definitely. But the jurisdiction, the decision lay with her, with Orpah. It would have been unrighteous to force someone to go against their will. But this is not, Judah is a tyrant. He's a tyrant at home. He's a tyrant in relation to um, both his son, whom he didn't give a choice to on the one hand, and his former daughter-in-law uh, here, here's, uh, as well. Because when you're divorced by death, you no longer, uh, that's, that's, it, is, it is essential for the gospel to consider this. That if you're divorced by death, that same old relation does not um, does not uh, count. It, uh, it isn't valid any longer. Okay. So what he's doing in in in, in verse eleven tells us a lot. He's a tyrant. He wa he wants something for his sons that he doesn't want for himself. He's unconcerned 
about raising up uh, uh, this seed to come, this Messiah. All right. So the question is, you know, well, is God going to just blast him? Is he going to just fire him out into space or, you know, throw um, fire and brimstone at him? Again, we're getting an idea of God's character here. Yes, he killed Er, whatever he did. He killed Onan, whatever he, yeah, well, we know what he did. But what he's doing here is to work out, is to change Judah, to sanctify him. Because we've seen even with the, the king that came after him, what happens uh, is that he goes astray. Yes, King David, but he's brought back. So we can't be too uh, be more lenient than God is. We can't consider icky that which God doesn't consider icky. But uh, we, we can't overemphasize God's grace to people and God's ability to change people who are outwardly believers as well. So, you know, um, we've got to balance this thing out. We've got to just take it as it is. All right. So, and in the process of the time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died and Judah was comforted. So there's death all around. Uh, Judah is death. Two of his sons die. His third son would die, will die if he, he gets married. He knows that. And his wife dies. Now, if somebody dies prematurely, does that mean they've sinned? Absolutely not. No. But in this passage, it's clear that that is the case. There's death all around him, as opposed to Joseph, whose story is going on in the background at the same time. It's life, 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 life. Of course, he's the minister of God's uh, message to the, um, the baker. And it wasn't life for him. It was death. But what he brings in um, Egypt and all around the world is life, 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 life. He keeps all these peoples alive. Whereas this sinning, apostatizing Judah, people are dying all around him. And he's refusing to bring forth life. And this is what's happening in our culture today that men are feeling to take the responsibility, me included, to um, bring forth children, you know. And this is uh, a mandate for us, you know. If you can't have children, you can't have children. There's no sin in that. But if you can, you better, okay. So this is a message for our time as well. What happens when men don't fulfill the responsibilities? Hmm, what happens? What's the woman's role in all this? Hmm, what we're going to see. And in the process of time, Shua died, da -da. Judah's wife died, Judah was comforted, and went up to his sheep shearers. Things happen when you go sheep shearing. It's all joy and merriment. Um, uh, the boys get together, they're previously apart, now they get together, they'll have a lot of fun. Uh-oh, Hira is here. Hira the, the Adolamite, the Canaanite. He, he's chums with him, next thing he's marrying a Canaanite. He's chums with him, he appears again, what's going to happen this time? Well, uh, it's a time of merriment. That's why Jacob chose to flee from Laban at the point he did because they were away sheep searing. He's going to have a good time. He's going to maybe be a bit, a bit jolly, a bit incapacitated. He's going to be tied up with the sheep. Let's go. Let's make our break for it. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, it was told Tamar, who'd been sent away unjustly, sent away but not released, as she should have been. Go marry someone else. Hmm. It was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Mm -hmm. And she put on her... Right. So, what what's about to happen is pretty crazy. Pretty, pretty crazy. Pretty unsavory. It's not, it's not good, and it's very easy just to dismiss it totally as being uh, disgusting. But as you could do with uh, what happened to Lot and his daughters... But there are things to understand there. All right. So, uh, it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father, and I'll go, going up to, uh, to, to shear his sheep. And, okay, so she knows Judah. She knows what this means. She's going to be, somehow she figured it out, as women often do, that she is being uh, left behind. She's being forgotten about. But why should she be concerned? Why, you know, why why doesn't she move on with her life? Not partially because she's been bound 
by this powerful figure, Judah, who's obviously he tell, tells what the, uh, his sons what to do. He uh, do this, do that, marry her, wait, don't marry that her, whatever. Uh, he's, he's obviously a figure with considerable authority, um, but he's being, uh, she's being bypassed. And, um, but I've said previously that she was a, a, a believer outwardly. A, of, she was of the covenant. It does not say that she was a Canaanite like it does with Shua, whose life screams Canaanite. Her sons are no good. She's no good. It's death, death, death. So she's figured out that she's been left behind. What does she want? She wants, as a woman, not to just have a child, which is a natural impulse with a natural and a good impulse with every woman, but she wants to, she she being a believer, I believe, wants to have wants to bring forth the, the Messiah. To have a chance to do it. Why do I say that? And um, well Consider what what happens here. It was told to Tamar, what does she do? What does she do? And she put on her widow, put off. She put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. And she saw that uh, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him uh, uh, to wife. All right. So she's she's concocted a plan whereby she will bring forth a godly son. Huh. She's a woman. She sees the irresponsibility of the man in question, the big man, and she makes a plan, which is kind of a little bit far-fetched in some ways and elaborate, and uh, you scratch your head and think, is that going to work? Um, uh, she's trying to seduce her, her, I would say, former or ex-father-in-law in order to have the seed. Is this good behavior? Is this something I recommend? Well, not wholeheartedly, but you have to understand the motivation. Now, how can I, how can I say this, that her desire is good here, is the desire is necessary? And don't forget that, humanly speaking, if she ha doesn't do this, if she didn't do, hadn't have done this, then, humanly speaking, there would have been no Messiah. This is not the result we want. Are there any parallels with this? Absolutely, they are. Rebecca, her husband, the big man, Isaac, was on the cusp, it's very dramatic, it was touch and go, on the cusp of blessing the unrighteous son. Everything that would be game over, forget it. No Messiah. The blessing needs to go to the righteous son to enable him, to empower him, to do what he needs to do. What does she do? She concoct a very elaborate plan involving clothing, Okay, she got, she's obviously planning this for a long time, just as Tamar was, because she was able to go click and go for it. Well, what does uh, uh, Rebecca do? No, Isaac, Rachel, uh, Rebecca, Isaac, Rebecca, yeah. She she ha makes these hand things which uh, make uh, him feel rough on, the, on his hands, you know, and uh, the same with his neck. I don't know what that would have looked like. But was, and there's a coat that smelled a certain way, and uh, she had the stew on the boil already. So it was an elaborate plan in order to ensure the uh, covenant succession to the next generation, involving clothing. What do we have here? An elaborate plan, far-fetched. I mean, the, what, she got a, like a cosplaying a prostitute. That's not you know, beat around the bush. And uh, it, it gets more elaborate because in order for a plan to go forward, well, it could have gone wrong. He, he could have passed by her. It was obviously very good looking for him not to have passed by. Um, but that could have happened. Also, well, was he going to go that way? Probably. Um, also, what if he had of had the kid on him at the time? So, oh yeah, I just happened to have a kid here. There you go, or or gold or whatever. And and it's, but instead she got uh, the, these tokens that absolutely made it clear that um, he was. This was from none other than Judah himself. So, yeah. Before we judge, and we must judge. We must judge righteous judgment. I believe it's John seventeen that says that. 
um, yeah, we, we have to understand it. So we have to understand the law of um, the leveret, which God thinks is a good idea. In fact, he knows it. In fact, it is. All right. And um, what else? Uh, we have to know uh, that the line of the Messiah was in jeopardy. We have to also know previous and subsequent patterns to be able to judge the thing, like I say, Rachel. But in terms of women being deceptive in order to further life, uh, we also have the Hebrew midwives who, who humanly speaking, ensured the, um, the Messiah and the next generation. And humanly speaking, we, we, uh, we, we also have the, um, the example of uh, Rahab, a prostitute, another parallel here, it's in the Bible, who um, deceived the authorities in Jericho, told a lie, God blessed her. Uh, so there are lots of parallels here. The Bible is not a moralistic book. You know, it's a covenant book and God has his priorities and uh, th this is here for a reason. So if you don't think... I'm, I'm telling the truth. Tell me where I'm wrong, okay? Had she not taken these actions, well, what would have happened? Well, we don't know. We can't... Yeah. It's not a pretty sight, but uh, there are lots of... Um, there are lots of... Uh, what's the word? Precedents for it and um, subsequent instances of it. All right. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Go, I pray thee, let me come in, un, un, in unto thee. Plain and simple. That's what he wanted. He wanted to fornicate. That's the biblical term, by the way. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And he said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? The Bible is a very plain book. This is how it happens. Uh, happened. This is how it still happens. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, now, wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? See the planning that would have to have gone into this. And he said, what pledge shall I give unto thee? And he said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. Now, interesting fact as well. The law of evidence. If we don't know this, it's our problem. We've got to know it. The law of evidence says that by two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. And normally that's a person who's a witness. Now, we have instances of false witness in the Bible, and the, and the law deals with that. But uh, here we have a true witness in that it's uh, two witnesses or three witnesses, but it's circumstantial. So this is important as well for us to understand. She knew the law of God, not just to lever it. She knew the, knew the law of God in that uh, she knew that the Messiah would come forth. She wanted to be part of that. And uh, she also knew this law of evidence. She didn't want to miss and hit the wall. She didn't ask for one thing. She asked for three things. And this guy wanted it just so badly that he threw the things at her almost. Oh, yeah, you want those things? Yeah, take them all. I just, you know, just got to do this thing, whatever. And that's it. Uh, signet, bracelets, staff. That is in nine hand. Now, later on, we discover that we have the cloak, um, and there may be a like, translation issue. But uh, the staff would have been highly ornamented, very, and uh, the staff, what is it? What is it? It's a style, uh, what is a scepter, should I say? A scepter is a stylized staff. The signet is like a ring um, stamp or seal that he would have sealed the uh, uh, documents with. The documents would have been, um, what, cuneiform clay tablets. This is his thing. <coughs> That's his signature. Very sophisticated, is it not? It's like um, uh, primitive Bitcoin, as it were, or prior Bitcoin. Um, and the bracelets, but yeah. And by the way, he doesn't have any, uh, you know, it's possibly not the first time he's done this. He doesn't seem to be scratching his hand, wondering what to do. And the Bible, very plain, and he gave it to her, and he came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Now, and she rose and went away and laid by her veil from her, laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. So did she become a prostitute? No, she didn't. She had a very specific aim. She wanted to bring forth the Messiah, I'm saying. And I think uh, that I make a good case. 
Uh, and you know, she stops it. And Judith sent uh, the kid uh, by Dullum to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, find her not. Okay, gulp. He asked the men of that place, saying, Okay, uh, so his fixer, the Adolamite, higher the, the Adolamite goes, tries to sort it out. Okay, can't find her, no harlots. Uh, Judah said, uh, Okay, uh, let's uh, let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Oh, he's, he's scared of being ashamed. Behold, I sent this kid, that's not found me. So uh, he's a little bit like um, David before Nathan, except, you know, he didn't get to, to keep. Um, uh, to keep uh, the wife, you know, it's just a one-time deal. All right, and he's, he's he's pretty confident, you know. He's no reason. He's just going about his business. No, no reason to think you know, anything's going to come of it. And that's the nature of sin, isn't that? You you, you um yeah. You know, there's nothing happening really. Nothing happening. Nothing happening. But the sort of Damocles is hanging. The hammer is going to fall, and that's the nature of sin. The hammer will fall. Okay, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. Seems reasonable. <clears throat> well, well, yeah, um, she's, obviously it's by whoredom, it's a fairly reasonable, um, and, and that's that's the way Bible the Bible uh, calls it, you know, Um Fornication, it's whoredom, all right. There's plenty of whoredom about. It's just uh, Bible's a plain speaking book. Uh, but there's a few there's a few discrepancies here. Of course, as with the Pharisees, remember they caught a woman. Uh, the, the they brought before Jesus a woman caught in the act of adultery. Huh. What about the man? Huh. Uh, what about them? They were all guilty of it, the same thing. That's why they went away from his presence, because they realized if they testified against uh, her, then they would be testifying against themselves by the laws of evidence, if you know the laws of uh, bringing witness. And uh, they were not fit witnesses because they were guilty of the same thing. At any rate, what they were doing was having one standard for the man, another for the woman. And the Bible does, in several instances, have a double standard. But it doesn't go in the way that men would like that standard to go. As in Hosea 4.14, for example, it says, um, well, you're committing whoredom. The Bible calls it that. And your daughters are committing whoredom, whoredom but uh, I'm not going to punish your daughters. Um, I'm going to punish you and I'm going to punish the entire society in which, of course, the girls, uh, the girls are. So there is a double standard there but uh, it's not as we might expect it. Now, is this the biblical penalty for uh, whoredom to be burnt? Well, no, but unless you're the priest's daughter. So, you know, the penalty is to be stoned to death. Oh, well, that's terrible. Well, either there's no whoredom or whoredom's punished, or else, as with Hosea 4.14, uh, what does it say? A foolish nation shall be destroyed or something along that, those lines. What's happening to our nation at the moment? It's being destroyed. Why? Because either sin is dealt with or a nation goes to the wall entirely. And we are headed for the wall, headed off the cliff. All right. But it wasn't his... But, uh, yeah, it wasn't his to decide there should have been an inquiry. Uh, but again, he was overstepping the mark, in my opinion, by uh, saying, bring her here and burn her. After all, he was no longer under his authority. She was no longer under his authority. He should have gone, uh, if she was in her father's house, he should have talked to her father. Who did, who did he think he was? Again, a tyrant. Not good. But has God killed him yet? No. Nope. Will God kill him? No. Nope. So God's working in the background. How is he going to turn this proud, obstinate, uh, tyrannical man who's of the covenant. How is he going to change him? Can he change him? Oh dear. And this is the moment. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, uh, by the man, so she's brought, I didn't realise that. So she was brought. 
uh, she sent uh, maybe that's right. She sent to her father-in-law saying, "Oh no, no, no." She she was called for. She sent to her father-in-law saying, "By the man who these are, am I with child?" And she said, "Discern, I pray thee." What a classy woman! Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelet and staff. So this was no pushover. This was no Millie. She's poised. Oh, discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. Why? Why, why, why? why did she have the confidence? Well, she knew Judah. She knew that he was weak in some respects. And um, she knew that he couldn't resist her. Uh, but she knows something else. Mm -hmm. She knows something else as well. All right. What does she know? And Judah acknowledged them and said, so Judah was a tyrant in his own house and over people who weren't even of his house. And uh, Judah had a double standard, one for him, in terms of he married Shua, whereas he chose a, a, uh, a good wife, and she was a good wife uh, for her sons. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, for himself, well, not so much. But uh, she must have known that Judah was righteous enough to admit when he was wrong. And don't forget, she was risking her life here. She was risking her life to bring forth the Messiah. Can't argue with that. Without her, no Messiah. God is not um, into poetic justice. Things just don't work out the way we want it to work out. It's, the Bible is not a book of poetic justice. But it is a book of justice, all right? Most certainly. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath, aha, this is the patriarch speaking at this point, She hath been more righteous than I. Are we able to make that moral discernment? Who was righteous in the case? Who was more righteous than the other? Well, is it a righteous thing to, to want to, to um, bring forth the Messiah? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, who has more responsibility in the case of whoredom? Well, Isaiah 4, 14 in this passage. Well, it's a man who has the responsibility. Um, the man is uh, has to lead, and he has to lead in a godly fashion. And just by man's superior authority, he has a superior responsibility and men we have to face up to that fact she hath been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila my son this is in the background she should have he should have done that in order to bring forth the Messiah or to let things play play out um, but he didn't because he loved his ungodly son more than the uh, coming forth of the, of the Messiah and you know we might ask ourselves the question, you know, do we love, do we favor the ungodly over the godly? Um, this was uh, was something in the case of um, your son being a delinquent, uh, like a juvenile delinquent. You, you had to, uh, in the law, bring evidence against that, even if they were the, your the, your son or daughter, or, well, their son, your son, uh, you, would, you, had to, you had to testify against them. We have to love God more than our children, particularly the ungodly, you know. Okay, uh, yeah. And she knew, uh, he knew her again no more. And uh, all right, well, it's pretty unsavory. I mean, it's not ideal, but if we use the word ideal, instantly we jump into another world, another moral universe. The word ideal belongs to Platonism. It's the ideal realm above and the realm of form or matter below. But there is no ideal world. Well, did God uh, predestinate this and is it his fault? Well, yes, he did predestinate. And no, it isn't his fault. Why did this come about? Why this situation? First and foremost, as with Isaac, a very parallel case, because of the irresponsibility and the ungodliness of the man. 
that's why. So the primary fault was very much, uh, you could lay the fleet, feet, lay it at the feet um, of uh, Judah, and this was the prime sin, uh, the lack of uh, faithfulness to the law of the Leveret, the lack of fulfilling the dominion mandate, and the lack of uh, desire to bring forth the Messiah. Of course, the Messiah has come now, so it's not the same, but uh, the Messiah is very definitely there. Now, is this a sort of get out of free card that uh, will say, oh, under circumstances, it's okay to sin? Is that the case? Oh, we would love that, wouldn't we? We would love an excuse to sin. Oh, I'm, I'm being a secret godly person. It's like, remember the, the children of God sect in the 1980s, don't say for a prayer for me now, leave it for the morning after. They were evangelizing uh, men by uh, sleeping with them. Oh, horrid, horrid, horrid. Is this, is this the button that you can hit and sin if it's for a good cause? In other words, uh, is this the sin that doesn't have any consequences? Oh, consequences, consequences. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Oh, dear. Well, a bastard child was born of this union. Was it the child's fault? Was it the children's fault? No, it wasn't. And uh, Does that mean, well, there's no consequences for that child? Oh, there were consequences. For 10 generations, according to the law of God, 10 generations. Imagine that. 40, 80, 120, da, da, down the line, 400 years and longer, because people lived longer back then. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. And the 10th generation, only after the 10 generations had played themselves out, and it wasn't their fault, but the echoes of this sin echoed, echoed, echoed through the generations. Who's in the 10th generation from... Um, Tamar and Judah? Who? Who is it? Well, Ruth, who is blessed. May you, uh, may your children be like um, Perez, you know, really like uh, the child of Tamar, something along those lines. We find it at the end of the book of Ruth. Uh, and who was Tamar's, uh, who was Tamar's um, father? David. David was the 10th generation from uh, this union. And he was the first of that to be able to, first of that family to be able to join the congregation, to be able to be a part of uh, the uh, civil life and official religious life of of the um, of, of of Israel. And he, of course, was such a key and godly character, who fell to a very similar sin to that of his great 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 grandfather but yet was known as the beloved of God. So, um, yeah, we're learning something about God's character, how uh, he's absolutely abominates sin, whether it be positive, uh, as in doing something which you shouldn't be doing, or negative. The sin that he recognizes here is not giving his son to, T uh, to um, Timur. That was the sin he confessed before the uh, sin of fornication. So th this was the big sin. No Messiah, no dominion mandate. Okay. So we can't uh, say that sin is only doing stuff. It's also not doing stuff. And that was the bigger sin in this case. All right. So huge consequences to every sin. So no, it's not a blank check saying, oh, well, in this case, in some cases, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. In fact, maybe it's a good thing. Well, it was a necessary thing, but consequences were there. But isn't it amazing that 10 generations after this, um, could you say that uh, David named Tamar after this Tamar? Well, possibly. It's very possible. He would have been very mindful of her key role. And does the Bible condemn dirty Tamar, dirty girl? Well, we don't find that, actually. There is tremendous condemnation of her. And Onan. And there's a cloud hanging over Judah. But at the same time, you know, God dealt very graciously and he was working, 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 working in Judah's heart through circumstances, through time. 
Uh, and what was the end of this uh, sin in, in terms of, of Judah? Uh, it was what David at least once in his Psalms feared more than anything. He feared being disgraced in the midst of the congregation. Am I going to be put to shame in the midst of the congregation? Oh, save me from that. Well, what do we find with Judah? He is disgraced in the middle of the congregation. He said, bring her here, burn her. And then there's a big custard pie comes in and hits him straight in the face. And he's disgraced. He's caught with his pants down. He's saying, look at you, you hypocrite, you know. Has God done well? No, he keeps working at him. He keeps working at him through history. And um, while his brother is, Joseph is faithful and he's tested and tried and uh, is offered the, uh, uh, this is something that I didn't bring out here. Um, maybe it's in a different translation, but the signet bracelets and stuff, I think that's, is this his coat? Maybe I'm wrong here. Um, but he, he throws these things at, at, at her and he actively goes and, uh, you know, goes up to her and seeks fornication where I'll, whereas Joseph's fleeing, you know. Um, where was I? I'm kind of lost track here. But anyway, that's not that important. So we see here how God works through this. It's not, not his fault. He works through it both to bring forth the Messiah and also to bring forth his purposes with Judah. And Judah, in a way, is representative of all his other brothers. We can assume that uh, there's something similar going on in his life, uh, in the other sons' lives as well. And don't forget how bad Simeon and Levi were. Um, they'd killed men. And the rest had taken, um, stolen the goods that, uh, of the Shechemites and stolen people from the Shechemites. Those are sins and crimes and um, punishable by death in the case of stealing men and killing men, of course. And he, now, this also helps set things up for the journey to Egypt. Why on earth would God have uh, the children of Israel in Egypt for such, a uh, for such a long time, tucked away in the land of Goshen? The answer is clear. Look what happened to the best of the brothers, Judah, who had the character at least not to murder his brother. What happens? Canaan is in there in his heart and it just comes out. This is the problem with uh, statist education, you know, and it's just the general influence of the culture. It just, it's in us. How do we get it out of us? Oh, it's awful. Well, God has his ways. All right. And he, he was, he's illustrating to us here and with the previous Shechem event saying, look, uh, as long as these guys are in, they can't handle it. As long as these guys are in um, Canaan, Canaan is in them. I got to, I'm going to move them out. I'm going to give them their own land. But another question, how is God going to do that? So the only, the only uh, time that they would be allowed to come back to Canaan was as conquerors and, uh, uh, and possessors and occupiers to do his will. So tremendous amount going on here. There's links to King David. There's links to Ruth. There's links to the law of evidence. There's links to the law of uh, yeah, witness. There's links to um, the law of what to do with, about whoredom. Uh, there's the differential responsibility between men and women. There's the uh, There's so, so much here. Um, but... Okay, uh, and Judah acknowledged them da, 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 more righteous, travail, twins were in, his womb, uh, in her womb. So there's a link here as well with, of course, Jacob and Esau, uh, famous twins. And there's a further explanation of what happened with um, Jacob and Esau. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound on his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first. So I think this is a parallel to um, Rebecca who asks of the Lord, it's, Lord, why are these twins fighting my, in my womb? What's going on there? And I think this is an explanation of that in part. One of the sons is contending for uh, being the firstborn, being the ancestor of, of Christ. This is my thinking, just as um, John the Baptist kicked in the womb when he heard um, 
uh, mention of Jesus. I think that's the, those are the circumstances. But it was full of the Holy Spirit from birth, from before birth in the womb. God is sovereign. And I think this is what's happening here. The character was there. The, the impulse of the Holy Spirit was there in Paris. And uh, what do we find there? The Holy Spirit gives him uh, great energy. The Spirit is connected with power, with energy, with drive. Whereas for us, we have the background paganism, which says, you know, if you're a spiritual person, you're kind of, yeah, you have these insights, but you're basically a useless person. Basically a powerless person. That's about, uh, that's uh, the big problem with uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and their idea of kenosis. And it's all Greek paganism. It's all paganism. Whereas what do we have here? Whoa! He wants, to, he wants to go. He wants, let's go. Let's get out of here. Let's, let's live. Uh, so when it came to pass, he drew back his hand. His brother came out and said, How had thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Phares. Afterward came out his brother and the scarlet thread on his hand. And his name was Zara. Uh, there's an interesting, just a side note here, but let's just underline it here. That... Um, uh, there was the red stew of the ungodly son and the uh, the red of Esau and the, the red of Zara, who was not the um, not the favoured son, not the son who would inherit. Anyway, look, there you go. Here is, uh, this is the Bible for you. No, um, no blushes spared. Honest. Biological. Let's face it. Um, does not gloss. Uh, and this is the father of the Jews. This is where the Jews get their name from, from Judah. And this is uh, the ancestor of Christ. Well, why does God include this? We've already gone through that several times. But, you know, in church, you're not allowed to have problems so often. Uh, you try to brush it under the carpet what does God do? He de do he deals with it. He says, this is it, lays it out in the open and works by his spirit to bring a big clack to the ego, to the um, the, the tyranny, as it were, of Judah. He says, okay, well, we're going to deal with this issue. We're going to bring him forth. Oh, the patience of God and oh, the holiness of God that uh, this this uh, that he should deal so with uh, his children and those who aren't his children but are outwardly of the covenant and uh, wh how salutary it is for those who would say to themselves if only I had the power if only I had the power uh, well Judah had all the power and he made all the mistakes whereas Joseph the parallel story he had all the power taken away from him his coat was ripped from him uh, whereas what did uh, Judah do? It, as it were, he threw his coat away. He threw his authority away. Take it, take, take, take. You know. So, yeah, wishing for authority, wishing for power. Well, hang on a second. Wait a minute. No, no, no. It's not God's way to seek to grasp power, but rather to go the Joseph route, which was a route of uh, service, faithful service, and exaltation by God in due time. The last thing, and it's a bit of a side note, but still, with all, I said earlier that what is a, what is a what is a, what is a scepter? A scepter is a stylized um, staff. What happens in this story? It's related to the prophecy of Christ in the blessing of Judah by his father Jacob or Israel. What does he say? The scepter shall not depart from. Judah. Scepter shall not depart. When did this scepter or staff depart? He basically threw it at this girl in order to fornicate with her. So in some ways, this prophecy says that God will work with his people to sanctify them. He didn't do this again, Judah. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't a repeat offender. So God is able to work. His power is able to work as such that it's able to work with our own nature uh, in circumstances, in time, to sanctify us and keep us away from sin. Uh, look, I hope you um, benefited from that. I hope you're blessed by it. And uh, yeah, uh, please do hit me up in the comments if you have any questions, either on YouTube or on Facebook uh, or uh, Telegram. And uh, thanks again for watching, listening.